Last week we talked about Acts 15, the Jerusalem conference, and how Paul and Barnabas and Peter and all these people descended on Jerusalem to discuss this issue of Jews and Jewish and Gentile Christians and what to do with the Gentiles. And the decision was made by James, the leader of the church, and all the people there that, that Gentiles did not need to be circumcised. So there's much celebration. And uh, Paul and Barnabas got to deliver one of those letters. They wrote uh, uh, lots of copies of this letter, and Paul and Barnabas got to hand deliver that, that letter to the church in Antioch. And man, their people were so excited about this. And uh, they decided, after they were there for a little while, they decided it's time to go on another journey because they had gone on that first missionary journey. And in Acts 15, 36, uh, here's what Paul says to Barnabas. He says, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are now. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them uh, the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone to work with them. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that when they separated from, or so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is a sad situation. Basically, John Mark and, and Barnabas were cousins. But John Mark had sort of uh, ditched them on their first missionary journey. We don't know why. He just went home. Luke didn't really elaborate. It happened in Acts 13. He just left. And so whatever happened, Paul was not happy about it. Um, but uh, Barnabas was like, hey, leave my cousin alone, you know? So some friction there. They did eventually reconcile, um, but we, we move on. We, and, and, and the book now does not follow Barnabas. It's going to follow Paul and Silas. So let's have that map. Um, and uh, as we zoom in here, Paul and, and uh, Silas start in Antioch, and they travel north. They go by land through Syria and Cilicia, and they go to these places where they were on that first journey, Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. And uh, so these are places where many people had come to Jesus. And one of the people that probably came to Jesus in that time was this young man named Timothy. Now, Timothy was, um, he was, uh, 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 of course, there's letters to Timothy in the New Testament. He was a, of mixed race. His, his dad was Greek. His mom was Jewish. And his mom and his grandmother were very devout uh, in their Judaism. They loved the Lord. They had a wonderful reputation. And, uh, and Paul's like, I like this dude. I want to bring him with me. So if we pick it up in Acts 16, verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Like, check this out. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Does that sound kind of surprising, considering what happened in the previous chapter? Like, I read that, I'm like, wait, 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 what? What just happened here? Like, they just got through saying, you do not have to do this. And here he takes Timothy, and that's what they end up doing. Well, I want to propose to you, this was quite different. And, and here's why. This had nothing to do this, there was no theological motivation here. You see, what they were addressing before and saying Gentiles didn't have to get circumcised, they were addressing salvation itself because this hard right faction uh, that, this was like, you know, we have to, you have to get circumcised in order to be saved. And he's over here going, no, you don't. So this had nothing to do, Paul did not believe that. This had nothing to do with Timothy's salvation. This did not have anything to do with setting a precedent for the Gentiles because they're actually telling them, you don't have to do this, but then Timothy is going to do this. So why? I want to suggest to you, this was simply out of sheer grace for the Jewish people and the Jewish communities they were about to visit. You see, Paul had it in mind that Timothy was going to be a leader in this church. And indeed, he, he was going, he would be eventually become a young pastor, and he knew that in these areas there, were, there was a, a, a large Jewish contingent, and they already knew, you know, Timothy and his Greek father. They already knew about his Greek father, it says. And that in itself would have been a little bit of a 
that's a hard thing. Like they're, they have just tried to make the switch. Like, okay, okay, it's okay for, for Gentiles to be one of us. Okay, it, it's okay. Okay, ew, that's okay. All right, we'll let Timothy in, even though his dad was, was a Greek. But then if he's not circumcised also, that's still really, really hard for them. Now, would they have been in the wrong on that if they didn't follow him? Yes, they actually would have. They actually would have. But, you know, sometimes being right is overrated. Sometimes it's not always about being correct on a given issue. It's not always about having that leverage. It's not always the principle of the thing. The highest value that Paul and Timothy seem to have here and by the way, Timothy did have a choice. It's not like Timothy was a kid and didn't submit to this. He was like, yes, let's do this thing, right? So their highest value was to love these people well. And if circumcision was going to be a mental block for the people they were ministering to, they thought, let's just take that off the table. And I find that an extraordinary, generous, extraordinarily generous uh, uh, thing to do, don't you think? Like, he did not have to do this, but he does it for the people he's going to be ministering to because it just might be a hard thing for them. He might be, they might just always have a bit of a wall there, and so he says, let me make it easier on you. I will submit to this thing, even though it would have been a, a very painful thing, <laughs> painful procedure, and he, he goes through with it. And I think that's an, a pretty incredible thing. He had the right to forego circumcision, but he gave it up for the sake of the gospel, for those who would receive it. We'll get back to that point. Let's go back to the map, Dan, if we could. They leave Iconium and go into Antioch. Paul really wants to go to Asia, and I'm not talking about China and Korea. I'm talking about the province of Asia, which is this uh, uh, place in western Turkey. That's where Paul wanted to go. That's where Ephesus was. There was a bunch of places. But it says the Holy Spirit said no. We don't know why. But he forbade him to go into Asia. So Paul goes up to Mysia, and he says, let's go to Bithynia instead. Okay, let's go there. But the Holy Spirit says no to that as well. Once again, we have no information on why or how. So they can't go north. They can't go south. So they decide to go straight west to Troas. And uh, that's a big city. And while they're in Troas, Paul has a dream. And he has a dream of somebody from Macedonia in Greece saying, come and help us. And he says, that's God. God has clearly called us to go to Greece. And this is why we couldn't go to Asia or Bithynia. He has something else for us to do. So they cross the sea and they come to Philippi. And that is where we spend this chapter. Now, Philippi is a, is a beautiful city, um, and it, it, it has a proud history. Philippi was founded by a very famous man in history, Philip of Macedon, who is Alexander the Great's father. Of course, he named the city after himself, as one does. And uh, so it's an old city with all kinds of history. And in addition to that Greek influence, it also is very, very Roman. It had a real mix of Greek and Roman uh, uh, culture and, and, and history here because uh, um, Caesar Augustus himself had taken the city and said, I want this to be a Roman colony. This is little Rome, essentially. So any rights and privileges you had in the city of Rome, you would also have in the city of Philippi. And there were many uh, uh, soldiers and, uh, who retired uh, right in Philippi. So it was a, it was a very patriotic place. Uh, people had a, a real understanding and appreciation of Roman culture and especially of Roman citizenship. Now, it wasn't a huge city. There were maybe ten to 15,000 people living there. And uh, I saw one scholar suggest there about 60% uh, of those residents were non-Jewish, uh, excuse me, were non-Roman citizens. So the, the majority of them um, are not Romans. Uh, but they would have had a great appreciation for Roman citizenship, which was a special thing to have in the ancient world. Roman citizens, for example, had like the right to vote. They had the right to serve in the military, the right to hold office, the right to buy and sell property. And they had the right to a fair trial. Now, if you weren't a Roman, however, all bets were off. 
That would be, you'd want all those things, but you wouldn't have them. You could get arrested for something completely false, and they could beat you until you confessed to whatever thing you didn't do. That was, that was what soldiers could do. So it was a bummer um, if you weren't a Roman citizen. But if you were, you could tell them. There are three Latin words that, that have been uh, seen in various places in, in Roman history, and th these three words, civis romana sum, I am a Roman citizen. And those were powerful words because if you were about to be harassed or beaten or taken advantage of, you civis romana sum, and then we're like, oh, lay off. That's a Roman citizen. We do not want the, the government of Rome to come down on us. So the people of Philippi uh, were, uh, were well acquainted with all of this. And they understood the concept of citizenship very well, these proud patriots. We move forward to Acts 16. On the Sabbath day, as Paul gets into the city, he goes outside the gate to the riverside, where we suppose, uh, there, uh, where we suppose there was a place of prayer. If you notice, the, there's a subtle switch here from they to we. Because all this time, Luke, the writer, was not with them, but apparently he joins them here. Um, it's thought by some scholars that this might have been his hometown. So he joins them. They go to this uh, place of prayer, the riverside. That almost certainly means there was no synagogue in the place, even though there was a Jewish community. We sat down and spoke to the women who came together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia was Paul's first European convert. And this was a really big deal. We don't know too much about her, except she was a, a businesswoman, uh, being a seller of purple, uh, that, that's a, that was a very uh, ritzy kind of trade, okay? It's like her selling Gucci bags, you know, and, uh, on the trade route to Thyatira. So she's probably a very wealthy woman um, and, uh, and possibly quite influential. And uh, so they start right there with her. That's where the church starts, right there in her home. They didn't have a place to worship. Might be the, sort of the birth of the house church movement right here. It's pretty awesome. Verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, uh, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Let's pause here. This young woman was being exploited, completely exploited by these businessmen. And this wasn't a case of her having some mental illness and people mistaking that. She clearly uh, had an actual sp uh, evil spirit who would tell people's fortunes. And uh, these guys were making tons of money off her. It's really, really despicable stuff here. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Well, that's true. They were. But she was saying that she kept on doing this for many days, many days. Now, that would eventually get a little bit annoying, wouldn't it? Sorry, I'm adjusting this for the sake of my sound man, who's being very bossy back there. Forgive you, Bo. <laughs> for many days. So at first, maybe it's like, okay, you know, that's actually kind of cool because we are. But this must have been in a, not such a nice way that you would want to hear this. And over and over again, after many days, like you're just going in and you, you just, you want, to get a, you want to get lunch and a Coke. And you sit down and you see that here's this girl again. Everybody, they're pronouncing the way. Like, it's like, okay, okay, okay. Peter eventually has enough of it. I just, this strikes me as kind of funny. Peter, having become greatly annoyed... <laughs> I don't know why I think that's funny. He's seriously just like, would you please stop it? You're so irritating. He, after being greatly annoyed, turns and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. I wonder why he waited that long, actually. But when her owners saw that the hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Now watch this. This is nuts. When they had brought them to the magistrates, 
Here's what they said. They said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Do you see that utter weak sauce testimony? What, what just happened? They're upset. Why are they upset? They're upset because they lost their meal ticket. They were making tons of money off her. Now they can't, and so they're mad. What do they say? What's their excuse here? Their excuse for turning them in is, it's these Jews. They're turning it into a Jew versus Roman thing. Had nothing to do with that. This is just so very typical and so very cliche. The, the Jewish people were under persecution in so many of these areas. So they were often an easy target, which has been true, again, of the Jewish people throughout the centuries. The people would just blame them and make these horrible statements, and then we see what happens here. It gets worse. They work the crowd into a frenzy, and the crowd joins in in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them. This is Paul and Silas. Uh, and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Just because Paul affected their pocketbook. If I had been Paul right about that moment, I might have had some words with God, you know? tell you guys, sometimes I have to have words with God. Does anybody else have to have words with God? It's I, like, honestly, I mean, I tell you guys this all the time, but w I think when we're upset with God not understanding, I think it's really, really healthy and right to go have words with them. This is what the psalmist did all the time. This is what all the people who really loved God would come and say, what's going on here, Lord? That would have been me at this point. Lord, what's going on? I, I might have not reacted like Paul did. Lord, you, you actually called me. I really wanted to go to Asia in the first place. I told my mom I was going there. I was going to see Aunt Jackie. <laughs> it's a really great waffle, chicken and waffles place. I wanted to go there, and you said, but you gave me this dream. You said, come here, Paul. Come to Macedonia. I came, and now what happens? I get caught in a race riot, be within an inch of my life, and thrown in this horrible dungeon. And it was horrible. And here he is in the middle of the night in this filthy, disgusting stench-filled place. And look at what happens. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They're, they're like full on like this with chains. They're like, Argh! and they're like, you're a good, good father to you. Can you imagine? That is how they reacted. That's unfathomable to me. They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prison, oh, whoops, uh, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. <laughs> now they have earthquakes in this part of the world. That was a pretty surgical earthquake, though, wasn't it? Like incredible precision with this earthquake. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. This would have been his alternative to execution. He fell asleep on the job. Prisoners escaped. He thinks that's going to be a more honorable way to go. But suddenly Paul, who's still there, cried out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. We're all here. All the other prisoners, they, they're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and was baptized at once he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. It was in their best interest when those chains fall off to leave. 
under the cover of darkness to run away. They had that opportunity, but they did not take it. Why did they do that? They considered the jailer's interests as more important than their own. This man who would be executed, this man who was beloved of God, this man who might well have been complicit in their beating just hours before, this man, they considered his interests above their own. That is grace, friends. And it's, he meets God that day. His entire family meets God. Are you starting to see how these guys are rolling? Do you see a pattern here? Let's finish this part of it. Acts uh, 16, 35. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have, se uh, have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Okay. Does anyone else have a question here? You have a question? Stephanie, what's your question? No, you don't want to, you just... Does it, there's, there's this hanging question here. Does anyone else have it? Feel free to call it out. No? Everyone's too scared. Why, why did he wait till now? Thank you. Why did he wait till now? <laughs> Sivus Roman assume you could have done that before you got beat. Like they, guys, they were within an inch of their life here. This was utter misery. They submitted to a horrible, horrible beating. All he had to do was Sivus Roman assume, and he did not do it until afterward. Why? Why? I don't know why. Luke doesn't tell us, but looking into this, I've gone back and forth with somebody. <laughs> Amber's helped me through this, and, 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 and Janelle, and I've been talking with, with Mar, all these, like, okay, what, what do you guys think about this? And we don't, really, we don't really know, but there are some things that I've come to that I really believe are true. First of all, you might, some, some might suggest, okay, maybe it all happened so fast you couldn't get the words out. Maybe. I don't think so, though. That's a pretty short phrase. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it was, uh, you know, maybe it was something else. Maybe he, he wasn't aware that he could exercise those rights. But I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's true, especially in a place like Philippi. I think that would have been top of mind. Like they understand and really respect Roman citizenship. So I have a couple other possibilities that I think actually jive pretty well. well one of them is this. In order to investigate that claim, if he, had, if he had said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, they would have had to take time to investigate that claim. That would have meant sending a letter to Paul's uh, hometown of, of Tarsus and, and getting verification, okay? Uh, you couldn't just, you know, email over an image of your birth certificate. Some, you know, it was a little more complicated than that. That would have slowed down his work for weeks or months. But even more than that, I want you to just consider if Paul had gotten out of the beating by proclaiming his Roman citizenship, I want you to think of how that might have affected this new church, okay? You have this, this brand new group of believers, and it appears that uh, they're, they're mostly, or at least partly, uh, full of Jewish uh, uh, men and women. And if that whole riot is breaking out on the basis of race, right? We, we have these, it's a whole bunch of Romans saying, we don't like Jewish people. If Paul, in the middle of that, had stood up and said, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman, it wouldn't have been wrong, but do you think that might have communicated something difficult to the church? I, what, like the message they might have received is, oh, you're not really of us. Man, maybe that's great for you. Anytime you get in trouble, you can just claim to be, you, you know, your Roman citizenship. What about us? We're not Roman citizens. How are we going to suffer? Well, I think Paul showed them exactly what to do. Here is how you face persecution, church. Here is how you suffer. You do it through songs of praise. 
You do it when, even when you're in stocks in this disgusting prison in the middle of the night. You still rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice. His entire letter to the Philippians is centered around that concept. And it was something they saw vividly through his life. What I'm trying to say is he had every, everything pointing to, dude, look out for your own interests here. Just civis Roman assume you don't want to get beat. But he looks out for the interest of his church instead. He looks out the interest of the, the gospel and the people that will affect. So we have this consistent thing throughout this chapter. We have Timothy laying aside his interest to forego circumcision for the sake of the Jewish community. And we see Paul and Silas and what we just talked about, laying aside getting beaten for the sake of the church. And then finally we have them setting aside their interest to actually flee away from that jail, all for the sake of a Roman soldier and his family. That is really, really something. Do you see that pattern? This is what Paul calls us to do. He calls us to lay our lives down. Not for, the, not for principles, but for people. Now, for him, the, the people, that was the principle. That you seek out, how do I love this person? That was everything. And it, in, in order to win some, he said, he's all things to all people. He will, he will put himself out there for the sake of his neighbor in some really extreme ways. And guys, this is a beautiful example, and this is our inheritance from the apostles, that we have the opportunity and the grace to do the exact same thing, to lay our lives down for people who have never met him, for one another, yes, but also for people out there who've never met him. Can we have the communion elements? I'm going to pass out the elements and, and, uh, and take this here in the end. But this is so consistent. This wasn't Paul's idea. In fact, he, he says exactly where this comes from in Philippians chapter 2. This is the letter that he wrote to this church. Here's what he says. He said, let each of you look not only unto his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul wrote that letter to the church he planted. He wrote it to Lydia. He wrote it to Lydia's family. He wrote it to the jailer. He wrote it to the jailer's family. He wrote it, I think, I, I would suspect, to many of the prisoners who did not run away and their families. I bet some of them met Jesus that night. He wrote it to this church that he had become deeply acquainted with. And it is by far his most compassionate and, and uh, uh, intimate letter. And all the way through it, he is singing that song. He's singing that song. Rejoice in the Lord. All the way through it, he's saying, prefer one another. Prefer, uh, uh, prefer them. Be like Christ. And in the middle of the letter, he uses this little phrase, which is easy to skim over if you haven't been looking at what Philippi is. Here's the phrase. You ready for this phrase? Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. When I used to see that phrase, I would think of it more in terms of, uh, can I get one of those, Brooke? I, would used to, I used to think of that in terms of, man, when I, when I get up to the pearly gates, you know, my name's going to be on the immigration computer, you know. Like, they're going to let me in. That's where my citizenship is. That's not what he's talking about. Thank you. To have your citizenship in heaven, to think about what that means and how they would have understood it, it's this. Your first culture is there, not here. Your core identity is there. It's in Christ. It's not here. What was he telling them? Friends, some of you are Roman, but you're not really Roman. You're of the kingdom. You are first and foremost of the kingdom. You are of Christ. This is secondary. 
He's saying that to the Jewish people as well who were there. You have a beautiful history, but you are of Christ. And I believe he would say the same thing to us. You have a, a wonderful nation, America, but you are of Christ. And the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God is everlasting. And if we found our core identity in his kingdom rather than any other kingdom, you guys, that's the beginning of truly being able to lay our lives down for others. That's the beginning of that because we're taking on the culture of Jesus himself. And if he lays his life down, that becomes part of our life. So instead of looking at others as, as, as constant um, enemies or people on other sides of an issue and principles and all these things, instead of seeing them that way, we can see them the way Jesus saw these people and the way that Paul would have seen that jailer. There's somebody who Jesus loves. That's the culture of heaven. That's not the culture of where we are. It's not. It's not the culture of the West. It's not the culture of America. It's not the culture of Oregon. That's the culture of heaven. And when those two are at odds, let's find ourselves in the culture of Christ. Let's find ourselves, let's find our citizenship in Him. On the night Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread and He broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the one who laid His life down for us, who set aside all of His rights and privileges, who set aside His interests as God, His privileges of being God of, of all his power and all of his knowledge and to lay that aside and to come down and join us, that is called laying aside your interests. He did that for us, to die for us. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. Lord Jesus, we remember you. We remember your sacrifice. We remember your generosity. And we say thank you. Thank you. May we be more like you. Let's take it together. And he poured the wine. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you, Jesus, that your blood cleanses us from all sin. Your blood is, is the new covenant itself. We say thank you for your sacrifice. May we learn to sacrifice for others the way that you sacrificed for us. This is our citizenship. We thank you, Jesus. Let's take it together.